Primo, international speaker and founder of the pioneering knowledge networking firm, Editorial Intelligence. She is, of course, the world's first professor in networking, now honorary visiting professor at Cass Business School in London and the University of Suffolk, and now, of course, the author of this book, Fully Connected, Surviving <coughs> and Thriving in the Age of Overload. Uh, just by a show of hands, so we know what sort of audience we're talking to this evening, uh, who does feel as if they are overloaded by information? Uh, pretty much everyone, okay. <laughs> Whoever didn't put their hands up, now I want to read your book on the, on the subject. Um, Julie, I wanted to kick off by um, just, I'm going to read a couple of sentences uh, from the book, which really define <coughs> for me uh, your philosophy. And uh, there's some ideas I think we can all get behind that I'd like you to, to elaborate on. Uh, you define here your principles behind the idea of social health which is what you define in, in the book. It's an, a way of interacting in a healthy way with this new world. You say, we all live lives dominated by and embedded in networked technology and social networks. We cannot be and literally are not the same as machines. And this is the crucial bit for me. We lack a management system to enhance connectedness and struggle on with no real organized process or underlying vision of what it means to be healthy in the age of overload. That really resonated with me. I think that's a brilliant Good. diagnosis. Good. It took about two weeks to refine that sentence. <laughs> uh, yeah. bullet points. Um, I was wondering, because you yes. say in the beginning of the book that it's 25 years since the internet became part of our lives. Yeah. At what point over those 25 years did you become aware of that issue, that diagnosis? So, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's really interesting that there is interest in this subject that you know exactly to your point you say put your hands up if you identify with the age of overload and everybody does we're in a moment we're in a sort of moment where our infatuation with and being enthralled to and uncontested acceptance of this age we're in is sort of I think transitioning into oh, hang on a minute it doesn't feel so great and anyway what about the downsides um, my own career has happened accidentally to coincide with the exact technological shift from, you know, analog to digital. The first thing I uh, worked on that was a machine, if you like, was a telex machine, which only very, very old people in this room will even remember. Uh, it was sort of like a very big, obese, ugly typewriter and was used to sort of put in messages, and of course now to Twitter. And so, that kind of 30 year period, which is effectively a generation, has seen basically an incredible moment in human history. Um, so the book is partly a way of saying, we just need to notice and own this dramatic moment in order to come up with strategies and tactics and meaningful ways of managing it in exactly the same way we've learned to do with our health, with our physical and our mental health. So, the kind of markers are, you know, we know that humans have been around from the swamp onwards for, you know, roughly speaking, I don't know, name your moment, but let's call it two, 200,000 years, 6,000 years, civilization starts, the stories, the cooking pots, the communities. And then if you jump to 150 years ago, that's the moment when modern connectedness as we know it, the lights, the roads, the railroads, the cables, began, uh, literally began, 1857, the laying of the underground cables, which, you know, ushered in this era in which we've become embedded with network technology. But I think now what's happened is, in the last 25 years, since the internet, since social, since mobile, something really very extraordinary has happened, which is we're not just living lives on networks. We're living lives in networks to the point that we've begun to forget that we're human and we've begun to act like we are them. And you know, I'm just saying, hello, we're not, we're human. So I've, I've really been interested in this cognitive dissonance, if you like, between the speed and scale at which networked 
modern life runs. And, you know, the sort of silico evangelism that says, scale is great, you know, not on LinkedIn with 28,000 connections, or you. <laughs> and the reality that for all the billion people that were connected on Facebook in a single day on a single social network last year, you know, there's actually only one number that unites every single person on the planet and has done for whatever it is, four and a half thousand years. And nobody even knows this number or relates to it. And that number is the number 168. Does anyone know what that number 168 is? You see, that's my point. It's great you don't know because it ruins my punchline if you did. <laughs> but it is astonishing to me. And it's the number of hours in the week. So for all the kind of, you know, ooh, AI, and we're all going to live to 128, blah, 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 we've got a finite amount of time, and we're doing more in that time. And so I just became really fascinated by this disconnect. This book is all about all the things we do that is connected and ways in which we can be better connected, but also putting into the conversation. It's actually a lot of emotional, psychological, practical disconnect happening in this fully connected world. Mm. But it's very interesting the portrait that you paint in the book because it covers a lot of different academic disciplines yeah. and that is almost inevitable because it's a new phenomenon and I, was, I got the impression I, as I was reading that there almost isn't a science to describe this world and quantify it and um, it crosses social science, psychology, anthropology and behavioural, like, economics, neuroscience, organisational behaviour. Yeah, and yeah. I'm wondering yeah. from an Sociology. academic perspective, is there an understanding of how serious this issue is? I mean, in the room we all agree that this is a problem, but... Well, there is, but the truth is that academia is very siloed like the rest of society. And, and, and what you see, I think, everywhere, in health, in education, you name it, is a dawning of realisation that in fact we can't compete with other disciplines and with other groups, we have to collaborate. And what does that mean when society has been very hierarchical and very competitive? And it's a big shift. And so in academia I think that, that I mean, so, certainly social network analysis um, as we know it is is relatively recent. I mean, you have the sort of flourishing in in um, the 50s of things like the sociograms of uh, well, even the 30s earlier of, of 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 Jacob Marino and and the six degrees of separation. Explain that. What's experiments. So, what's well, so sociometry is is the study of, of patterns in society through visualization, really, um, and. Uh, you know, social network analysis, I suppose, arose more directly out of sociology um, and organisational behaviour. And what it shows is the behavioural patterns in society. But also what's been really interesting to me is the maths and physics, not that I'm in any shape or form a mathematician or a physicist, I mean, you know, random graph theory still terrifies me just the name of it. but. But the way that science looks at the patterns of networks and how that can be understood in terms of how we live is there. I think I'm just voicing it in a particular way. I mean, I feel like I'm a communicator first and foremost. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a trained anything. I'm literally not a trained anything. And that's given me freedom to roam across these disciplines. So I feel a little bit like a curator, you know, saying, do you know what, I've seen this picture down in the vaults in the British Museum, and I've seen that in the prick in New York, and do you know what, I wonder if there's a shape mm. here. Mm. Um, because I think we're all really looking for some serious systemic structural change. One of the things that people think this book is about, which it partly is, is kind of how do I personally survive overload. And I sort of feel we, we're there in our heads. We are all experimenting now with switching off or not replying to emails immediately. We, we've talked about this over the last couple of years that 
it used to be that people would reply immediately to everything. And now somehow, I mean, hands up here who, who lets it go for a bit now because they just feel a bit overloaded. Right. And hands up who didn't, maybe even two or three years ago. Who's, so hands up if you do feel you've personally made a bit of a shift or an adjustment. Right. Yeah, Muggins here is still replying to everything immediately as soon as it comes in. But I'm aware that needs to stop. Yes. So the thing about social network science that's really interesting is that it shows two things fundamentally. One is that network structures, whether it's trees, bees, diseases, social systems, are fundamentally similar. Um, that structurally there's only a finite amount of groupings. Are they, um, you know, the tube network is a particular kind of closed network system. You don't go to the tube after this meeting and find that it's sprouted <laughs> another five lines. It would be a bit freaky. And it's partly engineering that means it can't, but it's something else. It's about the way we organize certain networks, is that we don't endlessly replicate them. With social networks, what's interesting is that the network structure is almost the internet's network structure is identical to epidemics, which is it is an out of control network. It's almost designed to propagate and replicate in a way that's called a scale free network. And so if we understand that and observe it, and that's why I opened the book with the story of the Ebola crisis of 2014. If we see the patterns and the similarities, then we can realize it's kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. And therefore, how we behave on networks has got to be in accordance with what we understand about how they're structured. And at the moment, I feel we've been sort of casting about the place like a sugar addict, not doing any exercise, wondering why they're obese. At least we have a literacy about obesity. We know that it's still being extended because of the car, the television, and the sugar industry, broadly speaking. But at least we understand it. But my point about social health is, do we even understand it? Are we even asking these questions yet? And I don't think it will take very much to tip it into a set of practices, because you only have to look at the physical, I mean, the diet industry, the wellness industry, it's not very old, and it's three and a half trillion dollars big. It's twice the size of the published arms trade. We're all, you know, downloading mindfulness apps, buying vitamins, wearing Adidas trainers. We're all buying into our physical and our mental health, and we didn't do that until very recently. So kind of I feel optimistic that these sorts of ideas could in fact just be part of this moment that we're all experiencing of saying, I, I, I want to organize myself differently. It doesn't involve downloading a time management app. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a, a prescription in the appendix of how this, I immediately turn to the how to, <laughs> what to do, you know, how to help, <laughs> tips. You know, there's the, no, no, the diagnoses uh, throughout the, the book are beautifully written and they're, you know, addictive to read and quite alarming. Uh, a lot of them, but it's this uh, picture. What do I do about it? Yeah, I, yeah, but what do you do is that's all in the appendix, which is great. Um, but at what point did you realize that this potentially could be a bit like the way that we now feel about smoking? So, you know, when I was a child, everybody smoked, um, nobody thought it was weird. Nobody thought it was wrong. Uh, are we going to feel that way about the way that we okay. interact with our devo devices? In well, I think we, time? I think we are. The moment I realised it was when I realised that our attitudes and understanding around food, specifically, rather than exercise and fitness. So I really struggled with my weight and with food in a very normal way when I was growing up, so I'm 53 this summer. And when I was growing up, there was no literacy or practice at all. You were either kind of good and slim, or bad and fat, and in order to become good and slim, you needed to sort of not eat, and, and then everything was fine. 
So if you had issues around comfort eating and all that malarkey, then you still, there was no help, there was no, there was just, I, I literally was about 45 before I thought, I need to understand food and its relationship with my body. And luckily that was the moment when there was a massive outpouring of, of publishing about, you know, fat and good fat and protein and carb and energy levels and things that have helped certainly me personally in a very sort of boring, you know, without oversharing way, not have that as a main feature and worry in my life because I've learned enough about it to, to sort of not feel it's a weird kind of witchcraft in my mind, but just a set of babies. Do you see what I mean? And so that was the moment probably about eight years ago, where I thought, okay, so it is possible to change. It is possible to not feel that there's just a system, there's just a reality, you know. Well, look, can we extend that analogy then? I mean, not that I want to demonize carbs, um, but if we're going to say that there's yeah. something that has become very fashionable is don't eat so many carbs and eat more protein, yeah. what would be the social health, health equivalent version of, of that? Well, first of all, just on this, it's a very fast-moving landscape. So, in fact, we've reached a very interesting phase now, which is we are not, those of us who are very up on this subject, are no longer saying, no carbs. We're saying good carbs. And what we're actually saying is very little portions, because, in fact, the human is stuffing itself with just too much food, generally, relative to the way we move, and that, you know... Uh, and 5-2 thing is very new. That's so the latest thing. thinking. So, just to say that, the first thing you have to understand is that there is no static anything anymore. That everything has got to be only as good as this moment. So I don't think any of us should plan our lifestyle or our organisation <laughs> patterns really further than six months ahead, operationally. I mean, I think we should be like hotel groups and airlines and you know, even publishing companies, you know, you adapt your production methods because things change, you change, the environment changes. So I think the first rule is that we just can't future-proof in the way that we used to do, um, I would say. I mean, I'd love to know what other people, other people think about that. I suppose I've got some principles around what I think social health is is our relationship to three fundamentals, whether we're individuals or whether we're in a department, whether we're in an office, whether we're in a school, whether we're in a call centre, whether we're in a corridor of power, which is our knowledge is engulfing us and is out of control and therefore needs to be regulated, not capital R, but just literally regulated, curated um, in a manageable way. Uh, so. Our knowledge has got to be um, managed. Our networks need, we have to have an informed set of behaviours around our networks. When you look at it, we belong to so many different networks now, whether it's Outlook or an intranet or LinkedIn or whatever. You know, there's most people, I don't mean to be facetious, but actually most people have got a better, better organised sock drawer <laughs> than they do an approach to their relationships, what networks are is relationships, whether you're on a social network or have an office thing. So knowledge networks, both of which are we're sort of experiencing excess of, you know, think of the network as a kind of bloated, blocked artery, think of knowledge as an infobesity, set against a starvation and a lack of time. And I call this, because it's sort of a business book and a bit of management speak, I call this the knot. Because I think, you know, if you do nothing else, just close your eyes and imagine tying a little knot in a fisherman's whatever, and imagine that those are the three correctives that need to be harnessed together in order for you to have some control over the problem. What that means in practice is time, I would say if there's, you know, my one takeaway, if I had to kind of pin the tail on the donkey, I would say treat your diary, your calendar, how you spend your time 
and the time frames that you operate on, like your body. So in our society, you are a victim if someone else is putting something in your body that you haven't chosen or given permission, either because you're a victim because you have a disability or you're a victim because your brain's been spiked. I mean, it, 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 we control what we put in our bodies. We have a literacy about it. Do you all control your time? No, of course not. Some of us have to visit our mums on a Sunday or some of us have to you know, get the kids ready for the school run. But equally, we also allow time frames and meetings and agendas to be set that we don't really like or that we don't think are any good. No, I can't do that job by the week after next. I don't even think that job's any good. I think we should be doing it differently. So, so I think that we have to really make quite big changes. So social health is sort of partly a philosophy and a mindset, but it is partly a practice, um, which is to, to, to take it step by step, just as you do when you decide you want to lose weight. You don't say, oh my God, I've got to lose four stone in four months. You say, I'm going to not eat carbs on a Tuesday or whatever. You know, you don't go to the gym and say every time all of these machines are available to me, which one am I going to do today? You create a pattern, and then you know what you're doing. But we don't seem to yet feel like we need to do that, and it's particularly worrying in, in the working life. So the, the, the health diagnostic continues around productivity. So you sort of said, what's your light bulb moment when you realized? It was partly when I thought, well, is the world a better, happier, more functioning place with all of this connectedness? And I sort of conclude the answer is yes, in some respects, massive advances, but also no, productivity is stagnant. Are we doing more better? Are we, we're certainly not richer. Are we joined up? Not really. So I do feel there's a need to, to own the change. Do you? What do well, you yes, think? Well, I think it's very much an argument for quality rather than quantity. Yes. And the idea that who are these connections? Who are the people in your networks? And what is meaningful yeah. about the connection? And if it's not meaningful, then why do you have it? Yes, and there's another sort of set of figures about, you know, going back to this sense of dissonance of speed and scale. So I think that the... the disaffection with politics is sort of the canary in the mine, which is we sort of don't like or have faith in politics, so voting <coughs> registration is down, voting turnout is down, and all of these new populist parties across the world are springing up because people are repudiating the old order. Why is that? Partly because political time frames are meaningless. You know, vote for me for five years or vote for me for this. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's out of sync with how real change happens. And we know that instinctively and viscerally. So subconsciously, people are like not happy with politics. I think that change is coming in exactly the same way to media and exactly the same way to, to, to working life. And in a funny kind of a way, even though it's disruptive, I think it's healthy. I think it's important. But I think we need to hear it and make these changes. So in the office, in a working culture, it's very important to be able to say, I don't really think this is good. I don't think we can make these deadlines or you know, how do you how do you really and instead what's happening is working culture is sort of saying, Oh well we'll give the generation Z and millennials, you know, big signing on bonuses. Um, or we'll give them mindfulness rooms. Uh, or we'll do anything rather than say maybe what we're doing and how we're doing it is not meaningful to people. And I think fundamentally the human in this machine age is roaring to the fore. And that's, that's because we are the ones that matter. And I think we're worrying more than we should about AI and about all the problems and the advantages instead of saying if you just move the needle half a percent in terms of the productivity and the output and the engagement of every single one of us whew, 
that's a lot of energy, would be creating a lot of result. So I worry that we, we've begun to slightly outsource ourselves and that's why I think people are disaffected and unhappy. That's why stress levels, 10 million days a year in the UK are lost, working days are lost to stress. Stress medication, antidepressants, that market's going to be about 60 billion by 2020, which is the same year that the World Economic Forum says there'll be 50 billion connected devices in circulation. So to your point, we're out of sync. There's only 200 functional countries in the world. There's only 168 hours in the week. There's only an anthropological number of 150 that we're sort of functioning as society, you know, units. So those small numbers are all similar, and yet the numbers that dominate our lives are the gazillions. Mm. So that's, and I don't, look, I don't know what you do if you're, if I run a tiny company, I don't run a company that's massive and at scale with 60,000 employees in Europe alone. So I'm not trying to minimize the problem, but I'm trying to say that may be why things aren't going well. You do use yourself as a guinea pig yes, for I lots do. of these ideas from Telex to Twitter, um, but you also have mixed throughout your life with the sort of people who are going to be facing these challenges on a grand scale, um, political figures, celebrities. Um, who have you found who has inspired you, who manages all this very well, either on a personal level or in, a, in their company or in their public life? Uh, that's a really interesting thing. Well. And who's a total disaster? Uh, generally speaking, I think big corporates are pretty disastrous. Generally, I mean, I won't name names, but I, I do struggle. I mean, there are fantastic individuals and impressive units and, you know, but generally speaking, I would say that the banks and the consultancies and the law firms and the kind of big, you know, engine of, of um, corporate life are pretty dysfunctional. Because they promote a sort of digital workaholism? They, and the people that work for them, generally speaking, aren't happy, right. are locked in, there's, mm -hmm. you know, information is, is stuck, um, and they don't know how to face the future. They're, you know, they're, they're, there's a sort of uh-oh moment happening collectively, like a sort of Mexican wave, I'm sure, I'm sure some of you who work in that, in that field will recognise as a sort of um, and I mean that's in a way why the economy is, is, is not as, you know, a sluggish economy is often a sign of just uncertainty of, and it's not necessarily all about Brexit, it's about people kind of, you know, large car companies, large computing companies, large consultancies are going, uh, is our business model going to be viable in 10 years time? I mean, you know, so, so collectively there's one set of problems in the corporate sector. Um, the public sector, I mean, I'm pretty hard on, you know, I write the case study of the Soham disaster and um, Baby P and things. I think that uh, there are pretty systemic problems there. But I'm quite, quite upbeat about organisations like the Foreign Office, where I've done a tiny little bit of work in that I think there's quite a sophisticated understanding of networks because you know, diplomacy is a network. It is about picking up intelligence. And in fact, diplomats talk about smelling a room. You know, and and I, I love doing these talks because we're in the room together and I'm I'm reading your faces and you're reading ours and 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 I'd much prefer this than to a webinar. And I did a live stream for the FT that we just put on my website. But it was quite weird because I had this number of people in the room, but I had an indeterminate blank number of people watching from New York. And I just, in a way, had to tune them out and like not, because it's just, it is a proxy, it's not as intimate. Um, I suppose in terms of inspiring, I mean, I said this to somebody earlier on, Somebody very, very early on in my career who I was really hugely privileged to work closely with for quite a long time was Maya Angelou. And I think that she taught me a lot of wisdom. And she taught me how powerful connection is. 
you know, Virago Press, where I worked, um, was an extraordinary publishing house and had taken a risk on publishing, you know, a relatively unknown black woman from the South who'd written a series of books about her life. And she connected so massively in this country. And I was about 22 and I was hired on the basis that, you know, you need to get on with our star author, Maya Angelou, otherwise this isn't going to work out. And we got on like a house on fire, largely fueled by quite a lot of whiskey on a, on a long train to the Edinburgh Book Festival, I seem to remember. And, um, she, uh, she had very classy tastes, actually. It was always some parrot tablets and uh, um, good hotels. But I will never forget watching her talk and recite and reach um, maybe 3,000 women in Lewisham who just had not been connected with before. And that, you know, inspired me, and I'm very interested, um, I only touch on it a bit in the book, but I'm very interested in social mobility and how networks can and should be extended, and, um, you know, I think an awful lot of money could be saved um, if you just allowed people from all sorts of backgrounds to to figure out who they are and what they're interested in and to bring them into rooms with people. Um, so I've got a whole plan for doing something about that, actually. Mm. But it's really interesting, especially that you mentioned Maya Angelou, because as I was reading this, I kept thinking, this is a book about the danger of the loss of charisma. Because charisma right. is what makes us human and it's what makes us connect with each other and it's what we all have yeah. when we're with people that we love. That's interesting. Not everyone has it in a room That's with people really they don't know, but we all have it with our intimates. I suppose we call it inspiration, don't we? We call it inspiring yeah. rather than charisma. And that's also connected to something that I'm sure 10 years ago people would ask you about all the time, which is how do you network oh God, in the yeah. old fashioned sense? And we've gone from wanting to know how to do that to benefit ourselves and promote ourselves and become more charismatic to wanting to actually protect that part of ourselves and not be so exploitative. That's so interesting, the way you express that. I mean, look, I definitely think two things. One is that what works for people is intimacy, you know. That's clearly the stats show it with the number of countries in the world and the hours in the week and blah, 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 and this. You know, there's a hierarchy of communication and intimacy is better than broadcast, face-to-face, -face, you know, broadly speaking. And that we've got a challenge, therefore, as a society. I think that, for whatever reason, most people don't even have fundamental confidence to know what they're about and what interests them. And I, I see this when I speak, you know, as often as I can to schools, to teenagers. I mean, I'm the mother of multiple amounts of children of different ages, but it's sort of different if you know them and whatever. Maybe some of them about 17. Well, there's five, three that I threw, and two that I didn't, so it's kind of, you know, and now my kids, which I'm sure we'll come on to. But, um, so, when I, Robert Peston set up something called Speakers for Schools with the idea that grown-up, noisy people like us and like some of you would go into schools and just say, this is what I do and, and might inspire children. When I started doing it, partly because obviously I'm not a proper celebrity and so they had absolutely no clue who I was and I wasn't a footballer and I wasn't on the television, and partly because I probably didn't reach them in the way I do now, which is I go in with bags of sweets and say, hands up who likes these sweets, hands up who likes these sweets, right, when you're brave enough to put your hand up when it comes to questions, you get the packet and that works, you know, pure bribery. But what I was, in fact, the first time I did this talk, um, when they launched it, I was on the launch day of Speakers of School, 